Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm good. Good. I see the moon over my shoulder here? Yeah. How, is, it, is it the real moon or a virtual moon? No, that's, that's the real moon back there. Oh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting in front of a virtual image of Nelly, and Rick is sitting in front of a virtual image of the virtual. Show Space and Science Center. <laughs> I should turn it off. And I'm the only real one that's in front yeah. of the real background. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you know, I was I was concerned that I would be too jet lagged to do this tonight because I just came back from a trip. And actually, it's nine in the morning where I was. So I feel like I just woke up after a good night's sleep. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so I'm here. I'm, I'm Rich Ozer. I'm here with Gerald McKeegan and Rick Taft. And this is uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center Virtual Telescope Viewing Program. And I uh, just want to remind everybody that the Chabot Space and Science Center uh, ha has reopened for business. And Gerald, maybe you could tell us what, what days of the week uh, Chabot is open currently. So Chabot is open in the daytime on uh, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. And then it is open for public viewing on Friday and Saturday nights. So you can come up to our observatory on Friday and Saturday nights and look through the telescopes. That part is free uh, to um, uh, visit the rest of the Science Center during the daytime on Saturday and Sunday. You do have to have a ticket for that. Uh, but we are open and we hope to see you. Great. And I uh, want to thank everybody who's uh, visiting tonight. And uh, we want to thank everyone who's been consist consistent with making donations as well. Uh, and uh, that's been very helpful over the last few years for us. And uh, if you're so inclined, your Facebook page will have a button to make a donation to the Chabot Space and Science Center. Um, if you're not into making just uh, flat donations, uh, consider uh, purchasing a membership. Um, and that way you can enjoy the benefits of Science Center mem membership for uh, yourself and your family. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I'm going to leave it to you. What's on the agenda tonight? All right. Well, we, uh, we uh, have a number of things we can do. I think right now we are pointed at the star of Betelgeuse. Um, uh, so... No, I've, I've kind of moved off fatal juice. We're looking at the trapezium right now. Oh, okay. So you may want right. to move back if that's. Yeah, and Rick, I'm not getting oh, your. No. I'm not getting your audio. Yeah, so. you're you're on your external speaker uh, rather than your headset, Rick. Oh, okay. All right, that'll take me a second to figure this out. Well, in the meantime, Rick, Rick just said that he's looking at the trapezium. Uh, the trapezium is a star cluster that's in the uh, constellation Orion in a part of Orion called the Orion Nebula. And uh, well, while he's doing that, I guess I can uh, maybe share my video here. And let's see if I can bring up an image of the Orion Nebula, or actually the Orion constellation. This is the Orion constellation. Uh, which is a very prominent sky, uh, constellation in the winter sky. Uh, it's very easily uh, seen because it's a constellation that has more bright stars than any other constellation in the night sky. Um, there are a couple of interesting stars. This is the star Betelgeuse up here. Uh, Betelgeuse is a star about 720 light years away that is close to... Uh, exploding as a supernova sometime in the next 100,000 years. So uh, you want to be sure to watch for that. Uh, another star down here, Rigel, is a blue-white star. It's a main sequence star, a very massive main sequence star that's glowing in a nice blue-white color. These three stars that you see here, we call the Belt of Orion. And what we're looking at with the telescope right now is not in the belt, it's in the sword of Orion. In fact, it's just this central part of the sword of Orion. Um, and I'm going to kind of zoom in on that here if I can. And there we go. So again, here's the belt. Here's the sword. And you see this fuzzy patch right here. And that is the Orion Nebula. So hopefully Rick's all set up right now. Are you ready, Rick? I am ready. All right. Uh, let me stop my share. And you can go ahead and share and show us the Orion Nebula and the trapezium. 
Hey, there you go. Okay. Okay, so, this is a live view. So how, how is this uh, coming across there, Gerald? Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. good. We can definitely see the trapezium. We also see some of the cloud. Uh, we're going to show another image here in a, in a couple minutes that uh, uh, will show a lot more than this. Uh, but right now, uh, what you see is the Orion Nebula. The nebula is this cloudy patch around those four stars that you see there. And this uh, cloud is actually very large. It extends beyond the uh, frame uh, of this image. And it is a cloud of gas and dust that is condensing and forming new stars within it. And those four stars that you see in the center, we call them the trapezium. Those are four very massive stars, very young stars that formed from the cloud. Once those stars turned on, they began to emit a lot of energy, which actually began to push the cloud away. You, know, you, you cranked it up a little bit there. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, but they, you see a lot more of the cloud. The cloud, like I say, actually extends beyond the uh, frame of this uh, image. But you can see it's a big cloud out in space. Uh, those four stars generate a lot of uh, uh, radiation, which is pushing the cloud away. It's actually created a pocket within the cloud, uh, which is nice and convenient because now we can see those four young stars. We can see the cloudiness around it. The ultraviolet radiation from that cloud, or from those stars rather, is ionizing the cloud, which causes the cloud to glow. So you see all the glowing colors from the cloud. Um, though that's because of the ionization coming from the ultraviolet radiation coming from, from the four trapezium stars. Um, this is how stars form. Our sun formed in a cloud like this. And virtually every star that you see in the night sky when you go outside formed in a cloud like this. What happens is the cloud is kind of just drifting around out in space. It's huge, hundreds or even thousands of light years across. Over time, the mutual gravitation uh, of the cloud, of the atoms and molecules within the cloud uh, start to pull on each other enough that the cloud begins to condense. And it doesn't condense nice and uniformly, it condenses in clumps. And those clumps eventually condense enough to where they become stars. And so within a cloud like this, you can have hundreds, sometimes even thousands of new stars forming all at the same time. Most of those stars will be low mass stars that take a very long time to form. But some of the stars are high mass stars, which take a much shorter time to form. And the trapezium stars are an example of high mass stars that have formed from the cloud the low mass stars are still in the formation process and they're actually embedded in the cloud. So we can't really see them very well. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has been able to see a few of those stars. You can see them as not the, the star itself, but the, the con condensed clump of gas that's around the stars. Uh, but the new James Webb Space Telescope is actually going to be able to look into that cloud in the infrared part of the spectrum and see all those young new stars uh, that are within the cloud. So that's one of the things we're looking forward to with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, to the left of the trapezium, you see three stars all lined up. And when people see this in the telescope, they often assume that those are the three stars in the belt of Orion, but they are not. If you recall the image I showed you a minute ago, uh, the, the Orion Nebula is in the sword of Orion, which is actually pretty far away from the belt of Orion. And everything that you see in this field of view is very small to the naked eye, so small that it would look like just one kind of fuzzy star rather than a cloud with multiple stars in it. So this is uh, the Orion Nebula. It's in the sword of Orion and it is in the night sky tonight. Now, Rick, you've got an image that you took. This this image here is a live view, which, which shows some detail, but you've got a photograph that you took 
where you combine a bunch of exposures to bring out a lot more detail. I'm hoping you are going to be able to share that with us. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's try that here, Gerald. There we go. There it is. All right, so this gives you a much better sense of the extent of the cloudiness uh, in the Orion Nebula. It just uh, extends uh, across the, the sky beyond the, the frame of even this image. Uh, this is a little bit wider view. And even with this image, uh, the cloud extends well beyond the, the frame of the image. Um, and you get a sense also that those four trapezium stars are actually within a pocket within the cloud and that the cloud actually surrounds it on almost all sides except our, directly along our line of sight. Now, we have one other image that we want to share with you. Uh, yeah, I don't know yeah, if you... Gerald, before we move on, I'd just like to um, uh, point out something here. Well, last year audio there, Rick. So if we zoom in on the trapezium, bring this. Yep. Oh, okay. So the the fort. Okay, my internet connection is unstable, as am I. So we'll see what happens here. But the four trapezium stars, I believe, are within about one and a half light years uh, distance of each uh, other, right? Of each right. other, so right. very close. And you know, I was doing a little research, and a little research is dangerous, I might add, but <laughs> I was doing a little research, and it, it seems that uh, Galileo uh, is credited with discovering the trapezium stars. Now, he in 1610, he noted several uh, stars in the uh, Orion Nebula. And then uh, a few years later, he noted a three stars. He noted uh, the, these are labeled A, and this is B, C, and D components. And he saw A, uh, C, and D, but he failed to see this B component, and it's puzzled me ever since. Um, the B component was discovered a few years after Galileo's discovery, and that's why it's called the trapezium. Now, there are uh, additional components uh, to the trapezium. This little star to the side here is called the, uh, I think that is the E component. And then there's another one that's an F component. And here at Chabot, uh, we often look at the trape trapezium during public viewing nights. And when we can see all four stars, that's great. But if we can see the E component, that's the fifth star, that indicates we've got relatively good seeing. And if we can see the F component, which is right here where the cursor is, we have exceptional uh, seeing for our location here up in the Oakland Hills. So just a little uh, Galileo trivia on the yeah. trapezium. It's interesting that Galileo was able to see any detail at all. Galileo's first telescope only had magnification of around three or four times. So... You know, he was just a, an excellent observer. And even with a, you know, very poor quality telescope, one of the first telescopes ever made, he was uh, able to see that kind of detail. All righty, should I uh, stop share at this point? Yeah, stop share. I want to show another image here. All right. Uh, this is uh, taken by uh, Suzanne Beers. And uh, it's a wider field of view. Ooh, very nice. Um, and she did this with an astrograph. And this shows a much wider uh, region. The, the picture you just saw was maybe this square right here. And what she did is take some very uh, multiple images over a very long period of time. I forget the exact details, but she was looking in a much wider field of view. Um, this cloud over here, there's some more uh, young stars that have formed that are lighting up this part. We actually call this the Running Man Nebula. So this is the Orion Nebula. This is the Running Man Nebula. Um, and this really bright region here, that's where the trapezium is. And in order to capture all this other detail, she had to expose it uh, enough to see all this fine filamentary uh, nebula detail, but that caused the trapezium to be overexposed. And so it just kind of completely washes it out. 
Uh, you can see just barely the three stars that I was referring to in the previous image, uh, but that's about it. Uh, but this gives you a sense of how huge this cloud is and all kinds of new stars are forming within it. And uh, this is just a really spectacular uh, image that she took. And, you oh, know, I, we I, just... I, I love the uh, the running man and how that has been uh, processed. It's it's like, actually, we should call him the swimming man. He looks like he's <laughs> actually in water. Uh, Another another feature of this uh, image that I really like is right in the the middle. It's this, I believe it's M forty three. That is that uh, spherical structure with a bright star right in the right, center. Right, right, right. Demarians, yeah. I think it's called, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's such a unique structure, and it's it it would appear that that star is right in the center and just blowing off a. Uh, a gas ring which is probably what it's doing it's actually another hot star that's emitting uh, radiation and uh, strong winds and blowing the cloud away and that's what happens once the star turns on uh, it begins to uh, blow the cloud from which it formed it actually blows that cloud away um, and eventually what will happen is all the stars within the Orion Nebula will turn on, the nebula will dissipate and leave behind a cluster of stars uh, kind of moving together through space. Uh, and again, that is how new stars form. Our sun was once part of a cluster like that. Over time, the cluster uh, spreads out and pretty soon the stars kind of go their separate way. All right. Okay, so I think we're back to uh, your live view, Rick. Okay, let me go back here. And <clears throat> so we've seen the Orion Nebula. Uh, there's one other object that I thought we'd look at tonight, uh, if you want to bear with me a little bit here. Uh, I thought we'd look at the Clown-Faced Nebula. Uh, no, we haven't looked at that in a year. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, we we did have one question from uh, Colleen on uh, the YouTube feed. Um, she wanted to know: Has the James Webb Space Telescope uh, shown anything as yet? Yes, it well, has. It showed its. It shown us. <laughs> it its, took a uh, selfie. <laughs> it's selfie. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you have a a a, a picture of that. You uh, know, I I don't have it, but they did. I'll, I'll try to find one. I'll yeah, try to find one yeah, while you guys did. are. They they have a camera. Uh, one of the uh, near IR cameras. Uh, they were able to point it back at the mirror which is what it's going to do anyway, eventually, uh, but uh, change the setting so they could actually take a picture of the segmented mirror, that's the primary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. And they did take those the, that image and, you know, kind of confirmed that all the, the mirror segments were in the right place. Um, they're still in the process, though, of... Um, of calibrating and orienting the, the mirror segments. And that's going to take a little bit uh, longer. It's probably going to be June or July before they can really start taking really good images with it. But they have taken some images. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to do is see how close they are to having all the mirrors aligned correctly. So they pointed the uh, telescope at a star, I believe it was a star in the constellation Ursa Major, uh, kind of a mid uh, brightness star. And they took an image from all 18 of the individual mirrors. And then they looked at them to see whether they all lined up with each other. And uh, not surprisingly, they did not all line up with each other. So you had um, one image that contained 18 separate images of the same star kind of scattered around the image. And, you know, as they calibrate and align the, uh, the mirrors, those 18 individual star images will coalesce into one nice tight uh, star image. And that's, that's just the process that they have to go through in order to get the, uh, um, the, the mirrors aligned. Uh, but everything seems to be working pretty well so far. So that's a good sign. 
I could show you, uh, I could show everyone real quick what that selfie looked like. I just grabbed one on a random, uh, oops, grabbed, uh, grabbed a copy of that picture on a random website. Right. There we go. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to head on over to uh, so Rick, can you guys uh, see? if you would put it in. Whoops. Okay. Sorry. Can, oh, can there it is. The, yeah. Yeah. Can you okay. see that? Yeah. There you go. So uh, it, this was really unexpected because one of the things uh, I was told by uh, one of the uh, web telescope project managers was, well, we don't really have any way for uh, the telescope to see itself. But he wasn't thinking of this one outlying case where uh, if you point the segments at a bright star and then use the primary uh, camera uh, or one of the primary cameras, you can get uh, uh, a picture of the um, hexagonal panels. So anyway, it was pretty neat. Uh, so so James Webb Space Telescope's first selfie. Yep. Right. Rick, if we can uh, share your live view again, I want to make sure we're lined up with a reference star before we go to the Clown Face Nebula. All right, hang on. Let me, you want me to center that? Oh, you got it. I got it, I got it. All right. <clears throat> That's close enough. All right, here we go. So you won't be able to see this in the live view, I don't think. So once we get there, uh, you'll have to take like a 20 second exposure or something like that. Okay, we should be there. Okay, let me take a quick exposure. This will just be five seconds. All right. Give us some idea how well yeah. we're lined up here. Oh, pretty no. darn close. Not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. Hey, hey, uh, uh, Rick, why don't you get rid of the crosshairs? There we go. All right. All right. You want to do another longer exposure? Uh, well, I was going to shorten it, actually. That was what, with five seconds, right? That was. Yeah, five seconds at 40,000 ISO. So we'll just bring it down a notch. <laughs> yeah, big notch. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice having a, a, a sensitive camera. Uh, that's there we, a go. There we, go. There yeah. we go. That's a nice one. <clears throat> okay, so what we're looking at is called the Clown Face Nebula. It's about 4,100 light years away from us. And this is the remnant of a dying star. Uh, there are actually a lot of these out in space. We call them planetary nebulae. Um, it means that it's a cloud of gas and dust shed by a dying star. Uh, the word planetary is misleading. When astronomers first saw these over 100 years ago, they actually thought this was uh, an example of a planet in the formation process. But it turns out it's actually a star dying. And what has happened is the star was once similar in uh, mass and size to our sun, uh, but the star grew old. As it grew old, it swelled up and became a red giant star. And during uh, the red giant phase, it begins to lose its outer layers of gas. It's the, the red giant is you know, now more than 100 times its original size. Its gravitational hold on its outer layers is very weak. So the internal pressure within the star is actually able to blow the gas outward into space. And that goes on for hundreds of thousands of years in many cases and eventually exposes the inner part of the star, the much hotter interior of the star. And at the same time, the star is running out of fuel at its core where the fusion process is occurring. 
And when the fusion stops, whatever is left of the star, which is now less than half its original mass, it all collapses down into what's called a white dwarf. And a white dwarf is very small, it's very compact, it's very dense, and it's extremely hot because all of that heat energy from when it was a normal star has now been compressed down into a very small object. To give you an idea, this star was once in the prime of its life, maybe a million miles across. After it has collapsed down to a white dwarf, whatever is left of the star is now squeezed down into a ball, maybe 10,000 miles across. So uh, it's very, very dense. Uh, in fact, the matter within the star is what we call degenerate matter, uh, which is kind of a complicated term uh, having to do with the, the fact that it's really gotten to the point where it's very hard to squeeze it any denser than it already is. And that makes it very hot. And a very hot object like that will emit a lot of its uh, uh, radiation in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. The ultraviolet uh, radiation goes out and it hits all that gas that was being blown off for thousands of years before the white dwarf formed. And that ultraviolet radiation makes or, or ionizes uh, the gas um, and or, or excites the gas depending on what molecules are, are in it. And that makes the gas glow. So you see this glowing shell of gas. It's actually multiple layers of, of, of gas that were expelled by the star. They're glowing because of the ultraviolet radiation. And right at the center is the white dwarf. And again, this is called a planetary nebula. There are hundreds of these in the night sky. Uh, this one is called the clown face nebula. And this is kind of a preview of what will happen to our sun in about, oh, let's say uh, five billion years, six billion years, something like that. Uh, the sun will go through a very similar process where it eventually will swell up, become a hundred times or more its current size and shed its outer layers of gas and then eventually uh, form a white dwarf and a planetary nebula around it. So something to look forward to, something to put on your calendar. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's, I've got it on my calendar, Gerald. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right, good, good. <laughs> hey, yeah. Gerald, there's yes. a, a, a good question uh, uh, from Colleen again on, uh, on YouTube. And mm -hmm. she wants to know, why is it green? Why is it green? Ooh. Good question. Okay, so the, the gas that was expelled by the star when it was a, a red giant is mostly hydrogen gas. But as the gas is blown off of the outer layers, the, the hydrogen near the outer portion of the star, I mean, the gas near the outer portion of the star is mostly hydrogen. But as you get down further into the star, you encounter uh, oxygen. Oxygen is formed by uh, the helium and carbon uh, that's, uh, that's formed in later stages of the fusion process in the core. Uh, they combine and they can form oxygen. So when that oxygen then gets blown out into the, the cloud, uh, it has a different characteristic. When you ionize or heat up the hydrogen gas, it glows in a very dull, kind of faint reddish color. And uh, we're, we're not exposed enough to see much of that red color. You see a, a little bit of a hint of it in, in this image, but not very much. But the oxygen, uh, especially if it's ionized in what we call oxygen three, which means it's lost two of its electrons. Um, oxygen three, when it's ionized by or by um, ultraviolet radiation, glows in this very, very bright sort of turquoise color. And so what you're seeing is the glow from the oxygen. Now, since it seems to dominate the color, you might think that, oh, well, that must be the, the main gas that's in this cloud. And that's not the case. 
reason it dominates the color is because it glows so bright in this part of the spectrum and because your eye is most sensitive to this part of the spectrum. The, the hydrogen gas is there. In fact, the hydrogen gas extends well beyond what you can see uh, with the green cloud, uh, but it's just too faint to see in this image. If we take long exposure images, especially images through filters, we can actually pick up and see that, uh, that hydrogen gas, which is in a reddish color, uh, but in this image, we're just not able to see it. So what you're seeing is uh, glowing high, uh, oxygen uh, that was produced inside the star uh, during its red giant phase. Well, you could see some of the hydrogen gas in this. There's like yeah, there's little, a little pearls bit, right, there, right, right, right on, there. The, uh, on the bottom. It's like a smile at right, the bottom. Right, the smile right. of the cloud, right? <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. That's why it's the cloud face. That's why yeah. it's like a cloud yeah. face nebula. Now I see it. I finally see it. <laughs> you see the cloud in the nebula. Yeah, I'm still looking for the man in the moon, but that's a yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is this very common, but they don't all look the same. Uh, planetary nebulae can look very different. They can be uh, kind of round like this. They can be sort of uh, hourglass shaped. Uh, like the dumbbell, can, yeah. Uh, the, like the dumbbell, that's a good example. Yeah. Uh, they can they'd be ring shaped. Uh, there's just a lot of different uh, variations on what they look like, uh, but it's all basically the same process. Um, you know, there are different uh, 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 features that will cause the cloud to look different for different stars. Does it have a planet orbiting close in? Uh, how fast does the star rotate uh, uh, during, you know, when it's on its main uh, sequence and so on? Um, hey, um, hey, Rich, you want to check YouTube? Uh, we, our friend is back here, so... Uh, and and so anyway, uh, you know, these things can take many different shapes, which, you know, of course, that added to the confusion of early astronomers. Uh, but it turns out all of these are just the remnants of dying stars. Now, somebody, uh, I see Farhad is, is asked, what exactly is a nebula? The word nebula means cloud. There are many clouds out in space. A little earlier, we were looking at the uh, Orion Nebula, which is a cloud of gas and dust that is condensing and forming new stars. Here, we're looking at a cloud of gas that was expelled by a dying star. Um, there are many versions of this kind of uh, what we call planetary nebula. Um, there are also uh, is another category of nebula that is the result of stellar explosions. Most stars do not die in an explosion. They die in the slow process, such as what this star went through. But some stars, because they're so massive, they end their lives in an explosion. And the explosion just blows stuff all over the place in completely uh, erratic uh, patterns. And, um, you know, we call those nebula as well. If it produces a cloud of gas and dust out in space, it's a nebula. All right. So where else should we go? Thinking we should avoid that big ball in the sky for at least a little while before <laughs> we look at it. <laughs> it's, it's still up above my shoulder, though. I can still see it <laughs> Yeah. So let's see, what else? Should we go back to Betelgeuse? Uh, Betelgeuse is always interesting to talk about. Actually, Gerald, do you want to show a picture of a nebula? I've got I've got an image of M1 here. We oh, yeah, that. sure. Okay. Yeah, um, M1 is uh, in the constellation Taurus. It's actually in the sky tonight. Uh, we could point the telescope at it if you want to. It's kind of a dim object, so it might take a little work to, to get a, a live image of it, but we can do that if, you, if you'd like. But this is what it looks like. This is the, uh, 
the M1 nebula, also known as the Crab Nebula. And this is not a planetary nebula. This is the remnant of a star that exploded in a supernova. Um, only a small percentage of stars die in supernova explosions. These are the stars that are very massive, stars that are like 15 or 20 times the mass of our sun. And those are the ones that explode in supernovae. That it is a true explosion, so there's no pattern to it. It just blows gas and dust out in all directions. Um, and this particular one was actually seen to explode from the Earth in the year 1054. Uh, and several cultures actually recorded the event uh, that they saw this thing in the sky, thought it was a new star. Um, and uh, it was so bright for a while that you could actually see it in the daytime. Um, so this is called the Crab Nebula. It's a remnant of a dying star and a star that exploded in a supernova. All right. All righty. Okay. Uh, speaking of supernova, if we want to go back to Betelgeuse. Okay. Uh, Let me go to live view. So what, uh, you know, I said a minute ago that massive stars die as a supernova explosion. We have a star that's in our night sky that you can see with your naked eye that is getting close to that stage where it explodes as a supernova. Uh, and that is the star Betelgeuse, which was that upper left-hand star that I pointed out to you earlier in the image of... Uh, of the Orion uh, constellation. Uh, I can actually go back here for a second, maybe. <laughs> there we go. All right, I'll, I'll share mine while you're still getting set up there, uh, okay. Rick. Um, yeah, I, I didn't hear exactly what star it is we're looking at. Can you say that <laughs> three times to? Be Betelgeuse, <laughs> Betelgeuse. No, no. Betelgeuse. <laughs> All right, I, I some some those. people some people call it Betelgeuse, but the correct term is Betelgeuse. It's actually a, an Arabic name. A lot of stars have Arabic names. But here's the Orion constellation. A little while ago, we were looking down here in the Sword of Orion at the Orion Nebula. But if you look up here, you see the star Betelgeuse, and Betelgeuse is a super giant, red giant star. Uh, that is approaching the end of its life. Uh, how you doing, Matt, Rick? <laughs> oh, I was, I was ready. I just forgot right. to press share screen. <laughs> All right. All right. There, there it is. Okay. So this is Betelgeuse. I'm, I'm going to say, are you in live view? So if I move uh, it. No, yeah. that's a five second. I can go to live view. This is, uh, yeah, this is that. live view right here. Oh, okay. That's not too bad either. Yeah, if you want it brighter, if you want to bring out the background stars. Are, are, you, are you sure it's in live view? Yeah. That's yeah, what it says. Because I'm pushing the button here and it ain't moving. No, it just moved. Oh, well, the image I see. Oh, there you go. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a delay between your computer and mine. Yeah, but, I, don't, uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying there's, that. That's true sometimes, but not all the time. <laughs> it's very weird. Uh, so anyway, this is Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is about a thousand times the diameter of our sun. This is a much more massive star than our sun. It has swelled up. It used to be a very hot star. Uh, you know, millions of years ago, if you had looked at it, it would have been a bluish white star uh, and very bright. Uh, but as it grew old and started to swell up, its outer layers cooled. And as they cooled, the color changed and went from that bluish white, very hot color uh, to yellow. And now it's a deep orange, almost reddish color. Uh, 
uh, it's hard to see that the, the orange color in this image here, but actually when you look at it with your naked eye, you can clearly see that it has a, an orange color to it. And that tells us that its outer layers have cooled. Um, and it will continue to do that. As it cools, uh, it can actually form dust within its outer layers. And that dust is sometimes expelled out into space. Uh, the star is now beginning to lose its outer layers into space. And there was an episode here a year, actually, it was at the end of 2020 or the end of 2019. I can't remember now. Um, when... Uh, there was an expulsion of dust from the star, and it actually ended up being a cloud of gas and dust right in our line of sight. So it made Betelgeuse appear to dim substantially from what it normally appears. It has a regular variability to it, uh, but it's a long period. It's like 400 and some odd days uh, that it takes to go from bright to dim and bright to dim. And this was completely out of sync to it and much dimmer than normal. Um, and astronomers were trying to figure out what was going on and whether that sudden dimming of the star meant that it was about to explode as a supernova. But eventually they figured out what it was, that it was a cloud of dusty gas that was expelled by the star. It just happened to be in our line of sight. And eventually that gas dissipated and the star went back up to its normal brightness. Uh, Betelgeuse is about 720 light years away. So when it does explode in a supernova, it's not going to be a problem for us. We're not going to get hit by anything from it or any shock wave or anything like that. But you will be able to see it in the daytime for probably a couple of weeks. So uh, if you're willing to hang around for about 100,000 years or so, you'll get to see <laughs> Betelgeuse explode as a supernova. All right. What else should we take a look at here? We got a, uh, another 20 minutes or so. Uh, I had to find my mute button. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was wondering there. Yeah, no. It was button. either that or I just fell asleep. <laughs> no, no. I'm, still, I'm, st I'm not suggesting that it was a dull discussion. I, I'm literally, I'm literally <laughs> jet lagged. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have 20 minutes, guys. So um, you have, I, you certainly have plenty of time to look at uh, All right, you another get any, object. You got any suggestions for what we might want to look at? I'm trying to avoid the moon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. I see what's going on. How about here. how about M M79? Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Well, what do you think about uh, the core of the Rosette Nebula? I, I don't. Think I think that's going to be tough tonight. Uh, the right. core that's, could be it, interesting. It's so? going to be tough with the moon out. Yeah, you're you're still in live mode, right? Yes, still right. in live view. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna slew here to Rigel. Make sure we get everything centered up. Okay, I'm put on the crosshairs. Whoa, where'd that star go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Betelgeuse is it is so bright that uh, it was just saturating the camera, even on a one second exposure. Well, here's Rigel. That's not going to be any right. slouch either. All right. So let, it, let it's me, really uh, strange that you guys are seeing it already. I'm still waiting for it to appear on my screen. Okay. Uh, I don't I, know what it is. Right. Zoom. Let Let me center it since I I can do it with this okay. and go the right direction. Perfect. Okay. There you go. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> I'm just now seeing it. Uh, it's, it's actually showing up on YouTube sooner than it is on my Zoom screen. <laughs> so wow, that's... I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> All right, so you're centered up, right? Uh, we are right now, yep. Okay, so I'm going to sync it and then head on down to M79. So M79 is what we call a globular star cluster. And you're probably going to have to do like a five second exposure or something, Rick. Yeah, okay. 
I, I don't understand why it is that I don't see what's going on, even though you guys are seeing it. Uh, we may have to go longer, longer yeah, than that. Yeah, I'm not seeing much of anything yet. So you're not you're not missing. No, anything I'm not yet. seeing much of sure. anything either. Let's go to ten seconds. I see. I do I see think, it. It's there yeah, on the. It's it in too. the. It's on the right quadrant of your. Yeah, of it's, your either, oh, yeah. it's either. Yeah, I see it. Or dust on my. Yeah. No, that's not dust. Yeah. That's what I thought it was at first. I thought it was my monitor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. It's starting to come out. It's got to be centered up. Yeah. And I think your All focus right. is a little soft. Yeah, I think we can improve upon that. Let me go to live view again. And we want to move that over. Oop, wrong way. I can just barely see. It looks like a ghost on my screen. OK. Uh, do, do, do. 10 seconds is a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it does look like focus is a little soft, but we don't have a bright star in the field. Uh, let's see if I can raise. Uh, there's that's either a star or a hot pixel, one or the other. You want me to slew to a nearby star, and we can. Uh, uh, there's, there's, I think a red star. It's either a red star or a hot pixel. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's pretty dim. Yeah, we need something brighter than that. I'm sure. Oh, okay, let me uh, take you to a uh, medium bright star here. Oh, yeah. It's funny. I can see your cursor moving around in real time, but I don't see the images in real time. <laughs> I don't understand it. Well, uh, actually, I think this is too bright, but I'll try it if I can reach focus up here. No, it's too bright. It's too bright. All right, let's go to a dimmer one. Uh, let me let me try to get it back to where it was focused. So, okay, let's let's go to something dimmer. Okay, here we go. So, bear with us, folks. This is actually pretty normal in astronomy. We go through things like this all the time because, especially when we're moving from one object to another in the sky. Oh, uh, here we go. That's good. Yeah, I'll try that one. All right. I think that's about it. I think we've got some atmospheric uh, Boy, yeah, yeah, it is. there actually is a little bit of wind tonight, so I'm not surprised. Alrighty. Okay, so we'll I go think... back to M79, right? Okay. Here we go. You still got your window up there. All right. I uh, still got the window. Let me. No, I've got. I'm still on live view. All right. Let me. I I see right. the cluster. Yeah. Let me. Let me move it over. Yeah, Rick. I think you have to hit the uh, the arrow on the, to get actual get live view. Yeah. There you go. Now you're getting a live view. Yeah. Actually, I I believe I was in live view, but let's. 
Yeah, I see the cluster. It's still a little bit off to the right. Yeah. You know what? You know, I see it there too, but I'm not sure. It's not moving. There you go. Okay. All right, that should be live view, but I'm like you're having the same problem I am having. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't moving. Okay, now it's moving for some reason. Well, you're in you're in you're definitely in live view mode, but you're yeah. not in imaging mode. So No, I'm not in uh, imaging. You're you're doing you're doing the trick here. To, yeah. I see. I see what you're up to. That should be there. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, got to move these images out of the way. So, folks, eventually we're going to get to M79. Oh my goodness! <laughs> there we go. Are you saying? I mean, I'm saying it. Is it not? I see it. Yeah, yeah, no, I see, I'm I see definitely seeing it. Yeah. So, okay. I'm uh, adjust the exposure to get uh, get a little more contrast. Should be coming up here. No, yeah. we need more than that. So M79 is what we call a globular star cluster. It's like a ball of stars out in space. This one is about 40,000 light years away. So it's a little bit farther away than a lot of the other globular star clusters that we've looked at. Globular star clusters form when the galaxy was first forming. So the stars in globular star clusters are very, very old stars, more than 10 billion years old. The stars in the cluster orbit around the center of the cluster. The cluster itself orbits around the galaxy, but they orbit, uh, all of the globular star clusters orb orbit in a region we call the halo of the galaxy. Uh -oh. So if you can imagine the galaxy, if you were outside of the galaxy looking at it, you would see uh, a kind of a flat disk. Uh, what did you do? <laughs> Are we still there? Uh, now no, you're I there. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. back. You just yeah, for a second some... lost it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, so, um, so you, you'd see the galaxy as a flat disk with spiral arms within the disk and a central bulge in the middle. Around that, you would see this very faint kind of a hazy region that's more or less spherical that completely surrounds the galaxy, and that's what we call the halo. And the halo has a bunch of old stars in it including about 150 of these globular star clusters. These stars are very close together. If you lived on a planet orbiting around one of these stars, uh, the, you wouldn't have much of a nighttime because there'd be so many stars in your sky and they'd be so close to you that it would kind of light up your, your sky. You'd know it was nighttime because it would be a little bit dark, but it would be like having a nighttime sky with about 50 or 60 full moons in it. Um, uh, like I say, these stars are very old. They're also very poor in what astronomers refer to as metals. Um, basically, we consider anything heavier than um, carbon or actually carbon and anything heavier, heavier to be metals. Um, these are just heavier elements that form within stars. And because these stars are so old, they formed at a time when there was not a lot of this heavier uh, uh, elements in the, uh, in the area of the, of the galaxy. So they are very lightweight stars, whereas our sun, which formed much later, formed from a cloud of gas and dust that was like a second or third generation uh, 
a cloud of gas and dust from previous stars that had ended their lives and had produced the heavier elements. So our sun has quite a bit more metals within it than the stars that you see in this globular star cluster. Um, now this one is kind of small. Uh, we have several others around the galaxy that are much larger than this. A little bit later on uh, this year, we'll be able to look at uh, clusters like M13 and M92 and um, M3 and so on. Those are all globular star clusters that will have a lot more stars than this one has. Uh, but these are common around our galaxy. And we see them around other galaxies as well. And they're also in the halos of those other galaxies as well. All right. And again, it's about 40,000 light years away. Yeah. Uh-oh. Gerald, this is going to drop again. It's uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> it just the second time this error came up. I'm going to stop share. Yeah, so I'm having some type of a... Microsoft related issue here. You, you, didn't, you, you didn't upgrade to Windows 11, did you, by any chance? No, no. Oh, oh no. that'll solve all your problems. <laughs> that's, no, no. That's, that's what I need to do. I, 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 would, I would do that that's 15 right. minutes before we start the next show. <laughs> yeah. oh. What next show? <laughs> what? Oh, my God. Okay. Well, you yeah. know, it's, a, it, it's not an unreasonable time for something like that to happen. We are at 9.55. Yeah. Um, well, and, there is one other thing that I wanted to mention, and I was oh, going yeah, to I was right. going to do a little PowerPoint, but uh, no. but <laughs> one of the other computer problems we're having tonight is we can't get the PowerPoint to work. So uh, tomorrow, February eighteenth, is National Pluto Day. Yay! Pluto Day <laughs> celebrates the date on which Clyde Tombaugh realized that he had discovered a new planet, which ultimately became named Pluto. Um, so he had taken some images with a telescope at the Lowell Observatory. It was a telescope that was de dedicated to the search for planet X. Uh, uh, Percival Lowell uh, had started the, the Lowell Observatory, which is outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. He started it in the 1890s. And around 1910 or so, he and a few other astronomers began to realize that there was something strange about the orbits of the planets Uranus and Neptune. And doing some math, they kind of thought, you know, it could be that there's another planet out there beyond Neptune, which is causing these perturbations of, of their orbits. So Percival Lowell decided to start a campaign to search for planet X, whatever that planet was. And he actually did some math, math to figure out where approximately in the sky it should be. And unfortunately, he died in 1916 before they discovered planet X. Um, but his brother... Uh, wanted to continue the project. And so he funded a new telescope, which was optimized for uh, photographing large fields uh, of the sky and was to be dedicated to the continuing search for planet X. Um, of course, the problem was that uh, most of the other astronomers working at Lowell really didn't want to do that. They had more interesting things that they could do with more immediate results. So they were kind of shying away from doing this search for planet X. But in the uh, late 1920s, a young Kansas farm boy named Clyde Tombaugh sent a letter to the director of the Lowell Observatory and said, I'm an amateur astronomer. Uh, I'm very interested in working at Lowell. I'll do any job you have for me. I'll even sweep the floors if you want me to, but I want to work at Lowell. So the director said, okay, fine. He hired Clyde Tombaugh. And for a while, Clyde Tombaugh's job was to sweep the floors and <laughs> do general chores and things like that. Uh, but about the time that Clyde Tombaugh started working at uh, Lowell, 
the new telescope that had been funded by um, uh, Lawrence Lowell, Percival Lowell's brother, uh, that telescope got set up and was put into service, and they needed somebody to start doing the search. Nobody else wanted to do it, so they assigned Clyde Tombaugh to do the search. And this involved taking photographs. The, the telescope was actually optimized so it could take these big, huge photographic plates on the back end of the telescope. Uh, they would take these exposures that were over an hour long, uh, and they'd take one on one night, and then they'd come back four or five or six days later and take another image of the same part of the sky, realizing that if, they, if there was a planet out there where uh, Lowell had predicted that it would move across the sky and it would appear in two different places in the two images. So that's what Percival, or, uh, Clyde Tombaugh did for nearly a year, night after night after night. He took hundreds of images, processed the images, he had to develop them himself, um, and then he had to put them on a device called a blink com comparator where he would flip back and forth between two images taken on two different dates, hoping to see something moving. Finally, um, he had two images, one taken on January 23rd of 1930 and another one taken on January 29th of 1930. And on February 16th, he mounted those two images on his blink comparator, blinked back and forth between them. And sure enough, there was a little dot moving back and forth between the two images, and its rate of motion was just right, uh, and they realized that they had found a planet out there, which ultimately became known as Pluto. So every year we celebrate National Pluto Day on February 18th, the day that Clyde Tombaugh uh, spotted the Pluto in his two images. So, say happy we, birthday! We, happy, <laughs> happy birthday! birthday. We, happy we, Pluto we, Day! But yeah, you know, we celebrate it. We celebrate it, and just in time to humiliate it further. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like no, yeah, no yeah. longer, no yeah. longer a full-blown planet. Well, it's now. You know, a, it's uh, it's a dwarf planet. Dwarf planet. And what's the second word in the in dwarf planet? Planet. So Pluto <laughs> is a planet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so what, what happened was when Clyde Tomba, or I'm sorry, Percival Lowell did all these calculations, he actually calculated that this planet X is going to be huge. He thought it had seven times the mass of the Earth. He thought it would be at least 20,000 kilometers across, making it larger than the Earth. Um, when they finally found it, it was obvious it was much smaller than that. And it was in a weird orbit. Uh, all the other planets in our solar system sort of or orbit around the sun parallel to each other. But the orbit of Pluto was tipped relative to all the other planets. It was tipped about 17 degrees. And it was highly elliptical, uh, whereas the other planets, their orbits are nearly cir circular. They are elliptical, but they're nearly circular. Pluto's orbit is very elliptical and tilted at about a 17 degree angle to the rest of the planets. Um, in fact, it's, it's so elliptical that a portion of Pluto's orbit brings it actually closer to the sun than Neptune. So it's just totally weird. And then starting in the 1990s, uh, astronomers started finding objects out in the outer part of the solar system, uh, what we now call the Kuiper Belt. And many of those objects turned out to be in similar orbits and similar in size to Pluto. Mm -hmm. So then the debate uh, began about whether we should continue calling Pluto a planet. Uh, if so, should we call all these other objects planets? or should we create a new category? And ultimately in uh, August of 2006, at the General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union held in Prague, Czechoslovakia, uh, they decided 
to create a new category called the dwarf planet and Pluto got demoted. Oh. But keep in mind, like I say, there's its category now has two words to it. Dwarf, dwarf. and the more important yeah. word, planet. planet. It's yeah. still a planet. <laughs> okay. Classific classification aside, um, okay. if if you've never looked at the uh, photographs that NASA brought back of Pluto in incredible detail, uh, do so. Yeah. Google them. It's right. one of the most interesting uh, bodies in the solar system. Yes, it so is. Do you want to call it a planet or 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 a dwarf planet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just call it a planet. Come on. Yeah, yeah, you know. I'm with you. Yeah, I'm fine some with of that. us, as, uh, some of, us of a up. certain age, know <laughs> Pluto as a planet. Well, you know, the thing I like to tell people, <laughs> the thing I like to tell people when we talk about it is, um, there are different categories of planets. You know, Earth is a terrestrial planet. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars are all what we call terrestrial planets. There are the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. There are the dwarf planets like Pluto and Eris and Ceres. And then there are all the minor planets, the asteroids and comets. So you've got these different categories, but they're all in, in the broad sense planets because they move relative to the stars when we look at them in the night sky. And the word planet just means wanderer. And they applied a term to celestial objects that moved relative to the background stars. So Pluto's a planet. <laughs> All right. Pluto's a planet. Well, on that note. I, I, I have one question. Am I permitted uh, a question? Yes. So the question I have, if, if Clyde Tombaugh was, was using a blink comparator for a year and searching for Pluto and finally found it, how many asteroids did he find? Uh, actually, and quite a few, but huh? asteroids would move much faster because they're closer in. So they would move much faster through his images. And they did understand yeah. that. And he uh. did find quite a bit of them, but they never bothered to catalog them. They just said, OK, well, that's an asteroid. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, th this is such a great photo because do you remember um, when we, when we were growing up and they were talking and uh, they were talking about Pluto and you'd read about Pluto? It was always a ball of ice. Yes. Yes. Right, a yes. ball of ice, and you imagine yes. it just as this boring round ice cube. And um, it turns out to have uh, incre an incredibly detailed surface with very interesting geological features. And this is a great photograph. Yeah, uh, got, a, got another photo that I'll share with you here. Uh, if I can get back to Zoom. Oh, I'm, I'm there. You're all right. Uh, so, so can you see the blink comparator now? It, no, no you're, you're still sharing, Rich. Oh, you're still well, sharing. Uh, all right. Well, let me yeah. unshare yeah. and then reshare. Okay. Here we go. So this is the blink comparator oh, that yes. he used. I all right. So, so what he would do is he would take these images, and they were big photographic plates. And he would put one on one side and the other one on the other side. Then he'd look through the eyepiece here, and there's a little knob there. And by turning the knob, it would control a mirror inside this device here. And that would allow you to either look at one image or look at the other image or look at both images at the same time. And initially what you do is you look at both images at the same time. And so since you're looking at exactly the same star field, if the two images aren't perfectly aligned, all the stars would appear as double stars. And so you would adjust the frames until you got them all to line up. So all of the stars would appear as just one star. And then you then turn this knob and this knob here and blink back and forth between each individual image. And if anything moved, then you would uh, see it as motion. And let's see here. I'm all screwed up here. Hang on just a second here. 
Um, of course, we we now do this uh, using uh, computers and uh, yeah, software. Yeah, much faster. A much faster process. This is uh, something that computers are very good at. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and and so these are the two images that Clyde Tombaugh actually used to discover Pluto, and. You, you get an idea of, of how difficult this was to find. That little dot right there is Pluto. And it jumped from that position in this image to this position in the second images. These are both of wow. the same star field. Obviously, the the viewing conditions, the, the conditions of, under which they were photographed were, were not the same because you got more stars in this image than you have in this image. But when you blink back and forth between these two, the star jumps from here or Pluto jumps from here to here, back and forth, but from here to here. And that's what he saw. And that's how he discovered Pluto. So oh. National Pluto Day. Yeah, you did well. That was, did, uh, yeah, that's that was a good yeah. overview. Thank you. All right, All right everyone. It is, it is time. And hey, uh, we're on overtime, I think we are on overtime. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We had like 50 people uh, yeah, that's attend good. That's tonight good. between uh, yeah. Facebook and YouTube. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I was concerned that, you know, since we weren't doing it every week that uh, people would forget. And uh, apparently not. You all, all right. have very good memories. All right. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, Rich, uh, after you close uh, your link to Facebook and YouTube, could you stay online? I got something I got to talk to you about. Okay, no worries. All right. All right, everyone. Good night. I'm going to say farewell until next month. Next month, yeah.